The last panel discussion will focus on the use of cloud computing in the public sector. And as the time is again very limited, I will very briefly introduce the speakers. Uh, Linda Strick is more than 20 years with the Fraunhofer Institute, focus and works as business developer in the application domain on the e-government. Thank you for being, with being with us. Then the second speaker will be Andrus Aslade, is Councillor of the State IT Infrastructure at Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communication of Estonia, with the task of blueprinting the use of cloud computing, open data services, and the citizen-generated public service originating from these technologies. Uh, Markus Lenatz is a Vice President, Public Sector and Healthcare T-System of Deutsche Telekom. His mission is in export outside Germany, the expertise that has made T-Systems the number one IT service provided in the German public sector. And uh, last but not least, Reinhard Zimmermann, Head of Unit Software and Service Architectures and Infrastructures at DG Information Society and Media at the European Commission. Uh, thanks very much for being with us. As a politician, I have to get a message. That's, uh, I think, always the always obligation for a politician. I'd like to leave with a very short message. Cloud computing was developed by people for the people. It will be regulated and standardized by people for the people. And especially when we are talking about the public sector, it will be used by people for other people. And therefore, we can make that can make a statement that cloud computing is not a technical domain. It has a human face. I do hope it has a woman, woman face, because women normally care a bit more on the small, tiny issues, which can be a highest risk potential. That's the only message I'd like to leave today, that it's not a technical issue, it has a human face. And with that, I immediately wish to floor to our first speaker, Linda. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very for that very nice uh, in introduction. Uh, and I agree, it uh, cloud is not a technical thing. Um, it's nice to have it uh, human and a woman face, but uh, uh, I think it's a concept um, in general. And um, there is a lot of technology available which can be used to make sure that cloud happens. I try to push the button. No, it's the end. <laughs> okay, sorry. So we have heard a lot, and I cannot tell you anything new because cloud computing for the public sector, the biggest reason for not going to cloud computing in the public sector is data protection. That's one thing because uh, it's a question of control. What they have to do, it's a question of legal constraints. So. What, what is it the public sector is going for at the moment? So we have done a study in um, 2010 on cloud computing for the public sector. The one thing is, and that's what we didn't hear today beforehand, just use a private cloud. So the public sector will use cloud. It's not the question if they go cloud. They already went cloud, but they went for private cloud. But what's the problem with private clouds? So just in the example of Germany, they have, we have these more bigger data centers, not the small ones. So if you collect all these big data centers and everyone will become a cloud, so we have more than 400 clouds. Does it help? No. Does it consolidate? No. Are they really cloud? No. <laughs> They're not really cloud. So that, but that's a first step. So they have the idea and think we have to go to something. But what is cloud also? Cloud is a model for cooperation. If you don't cooperate, you cannot go for cloud. So that's one thing what I think is very important. So that is the next step, which we would call maybe community cloud, call it what you want, but it's you have a cooperation between different cloud providers where you can exchange and share the basic infrastructure, for example. You can share services. You have in these community cloud the main or the same obligations for security, for privacy, and things like that. So that is something what you could do today. Technically, it's no problem. Technically, federated security, federated access control, 
it's all done, maybe research-based, they're not in real uh, systems running, but they're European projects running uh, on exactly those kinds of things in the e-government area. There are a few huge ones like Storks, Papo, which exactly address those things. So technically, it's maybe not that feasible now, but it's not a problem. The biggest problem is what people have in their head and the not, the not willingness to cooperate. They say yes, but it's also a matter of political willingness to open up and to say yes, we want to cooperate, we want to open up, and we will find a way of doing that. So currently, public cloud for public sector is too risky. Rather than you look at open data, and open data is one field where you can just start and where the public sector can start using the cloud right now. Um, what we think is also is quite feasible today is using a hybrid cloud, so you have a public cloud and you have a private cloud and you outsource only those things in the public cloud which is um, not measure ma not uh, important for security or for data protection. And as we heard this morning, you have several levels of data protection. Uh, not everything is or has to stay uh, in the security environment. Things are with different levels. The other thing, uh, just mentioning and looking what we have talked or what we have heard today, um, I as well as others, I welcome very much the, the new uh, data protection, uh, it's not the regu regu regulation, it's a regulation, right, sorry. Uh, because what was beforehand within Europe, even if you say you can go from the data protection point of view in Europe, what are the cloud providers offering? So you have different data protection laws in Europe. We have a study on that. If you are interested, you can look at our website. But that's the other ri risk. So the providers, how can they provide the right environment for Europe? With, it, with this new regulation, it helps much more. And this goes also in the direction of what I think means interoperability. So we talk about technical interoperability, um, semantic interoperability, but what we have to talk about is also about legal and political interoperability. So legal make standard laws or make standards in that form that are, they are feasible and easy to understand within Europe. You're sitting here, so I think I can say that. This thing is difficult for me. Yes, it's not much more what I have. Just, um, just, I'm, I'm, I, I'll take it like that because I, okay, no, yes. So the second thing is we have already talked a lot of about standardization and interoperability. So what we see is if you go in cloud, and that's the other thing where uh, also the public sector says we don't want to go because we don't know if we, if we are stuck within one cloud, we cannot go to another cloud. Um, we think there are standards available. I learned four weeks ago that nearly every standard is available at the Cloudscape event. Um, so what you need is to know which standards are available and for what reason and in which context you put them. So what we try to do and input into the ISO standards is a method or a methodology, methodology for describing use cases and usage scenarios in text form format and then also put in the constraints, the legal constraints. And then you identify from those steps further down which one are the relevant standards and is there a need for more standards or do we already have enough standards with those? So the way of using use cases and usage scenarios helps much better to identify standards and would also help governments to be more um, secure on interoperability because that's also one of those reasons what they uh, claim at the moment. I have, this is just a picture of showing what it is. 
And in general, um, coming back to the mass data in the cloud and what you have is not only is YouTube, is Twitter, whatever. So you have an immense mass of data in the cloud, if you make it open or not, but if you move it, uh, and that's something what I heard beforehand was very important. If you move it, make sure big data to move, you need the internet and you need the capacity to do so. Um, and so I'm not sure if the lock-in argument is a real argument. Um, and with that, I want to close. Thank you. Thank you. So I think it was proof that the women can do it in time. Yeah, we use less time than it was Was I unable to give the second speaker? Yes. Uh, my job description is actually saying that I'm dealing with making Estonian government working on a cloud. So <laughs> a little bit inside information how it's going with six pilots concurrently running. And, and if I get my slides, then I will also show some pictures about, um, about what we have done and what the problems might be. But, uh, but basically, if still no slides. Can I get this one minute back? <laughs> uh, uh, well, that uh, if we look at the current situation, then cloud is pretty much everywhere. And, and, and everybody has a little bit different description of what the cloud is and how to approach and how should government approach to the cloud. Uh, I had recently a very nice um, business meeting with a one of the major IT companies, which name I don't name here because they are in, in the audience as well, but, but I got sold uh, extensively a product named Cloud in a Box. So, yes, that's, that is apparently that's, that's uh, such a product in existence. Well, anyway. Uh, we thank you. Uh, I borrowed this one from the Gartner, and this pretty much puts us in a picture why is that the cloud is now everywhere? Because um, if you look at this, this is actually a study called Government Hype Cycle 2011. And, and if you look at then, cloud is just crawling at this very, very, very high peak when it's only can free fall for the next couple of years and then get to the maturity phase, hopefully. So uh, a little bit before that, Already on the downfall phase is the open data, which is also pretty much everybody talking about. And I agree with the previous speaker that the truth is that uh, probably the key element at the moment of getting government successfully working on a cloud environment is to combine these two. So basically, uh, as there are so many issues still up with a, and an unanswered with how the cloud should be actually uh, approached by the government from the data security perspective, data integrity perspective, and, 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 and how to connect different institutions successfully on the platform, it is quite clear that it will stall for the next couple of years to come if we don't start from something which is already there. And then open data is a good starting point by definition because it is open data. So the, uh, it doesn't mean that there are no security issues though because um, uh, because even with open, open data, you still have to manage data integrity. But, uh, but, but that's still a little bit easier to do than, than, than wrestling just from the beginning with all concerns right away. Um, in parallel with that, what we see happening is actually a new public service approach. And um, recent events, you know, now almost a year ago, what, uh, what, what had huge political shifts taken on in Arabic world and then some places else as well, actually showed that there are certain world orders which are not probably tolerated anymore. But the truth is that in a democratic society, there is a little bit problem with, uh, between the public service and the citizens as well, because pretty much everywhere in the world, the citizens have been alienating from the, or government alienating from the citizens, or vice versa, take it as you wish. And something has to be changed there, because the governance 
has been going further and further out from the citizens' hands. It's practically that you can elect somebody every once in a while, and this is pretty much, pretty much what you can do. Uh, it is also true that most of the sort of direct democracy approaches, would they be web-based or, 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 or some other form, uh, most of such direct, um, direct democracy attempts have been not that successful either. So, so far in past five, six, seven years, every attempt to engage citizens more actively in, in getting, their, uh, the, getting their word out and then getting the, getting the countries more and more coherent with their citizens have not been that, uh, that well maintained or have not been that successful. So if you look at how to solve this, then the open data is probably one of the key elements there because um, it is in some way of giving a country back to the people. It is about publishing what we have about the country. It is about publishing what public service is doing. It is about giving this neural network of the, of the government out, hoping that something will come back. And, and uh, in idea, it is very beautiful uh, that, that we will publish the data and then all the, school children, uh, all the school children are starting to build services based on that and all the local governments are starting to build their own services without asking a single penny of money from the government and everybody is very happy with that. Except, uh, and, and then there is a very nice study that also says that somewhere there is a 40 billion euros in, for the, for the um, uh, private enterprises in all that. Uh, well, the truth is that we have seen open data published now almost regularly through different sites on the European Union and, and on, the, on the worldwide scale as well, but we don't see this uh, rush of services, mostly because what can be monetized has been monetized already uh, in past 10 or 20 years, talking about statistics, talking about uh, weather data, talking about um, uh, some, some other aspects of open data which is already there and very successfully put in work as a business, but we don't see that much uh, new services happening from the data, except the uh, obvious that if you put the bus stations coordinates as a public data, you will end up with Google mashup with bus stations on the map. So that's, that's, that's happening everywhere. And this is where the cloud probably kicks in. My press button, does it click in? Yes. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and one, key element of the cloud is that if you look at the current approach for, uh, by the public data and, and open data, then it is always treated as it should be some sort of huge archive which is published and then somebody should sort of take this one terabyte worth of data and host it somewhere and then be very happy to build services on top of it. While the very same people what we wish to build those services, they normally don't bother hosting things. So we have been setting this open data barrier very high and this is really the moment where cloud can solve the problem because at this point where governments start hosting the data in the cloud and give the open data out as a readily data as a service so that everybody who can have an, any idea about what to do with the data can start right away from building an application Rather than uh, rather than start with uh, with first finding yourself a some sort of service provider which can host this terabyte for you and then start building service after that, is 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 something which is probably going to be a key key aspect of it. So it makes the development easier. And and one other important thing is the parallel copies of the data because uh, what we what we see happening with the classic open data is that this open data gets rehosted several times, what means that now you have like 10 different copies of the open data which are all reflecting the same and out of those 10 copies, 9 are old and having a dead services and one is a working service which is running on old data. So putting it in a cloud and putting it in the same place for everybody and making it scalable enough that it will be possible to access is probably something that could make this uh, open data based public service happening. There are also some stay. <laughs> there are also some 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 aspects, of course, which uh, which are still problematic, and then a lot of them have been actually addressed in the past couple of panels already. Uh, but um, but but the, one of the very important one is that at the moment 
nobody knows how to make a successful proc procurement for the cloud from the government side. First of all, there is no good definition. The second, there is a little bit problem that if you look at the, if you look at the technology lock-ins, then it is obvious that you can't sell out somebody. You can't do the thing that I will take everything from the Amazon and everybody else uh, can, could lay low for the next 10 years to come. But the question is how you standardize this middle layer in it there is going to be a key issue and then this is actually why we're piloting it and this is what, we, what we're trying to solve. So just some aspects of, of the problems, but I think that if you combine this with open data and, and we eventually see cloud services to happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'd like to ask Marcus Lenatz, and I'd just like to mention that I was voting full day in the Budget Control Committee, so I'm happy that they are not aware of this procurement issue yet. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here tonight uh, to talk to you about cloud services in the public sector. So uh, industry is coming up with a new product, cloud services. We're in the middle of a financial crisis. Industry comes with a new product, which is, of course, uh, more expensive than the ones before. Is this the right point in time to offer new services? Yes, it is, because, because, because cloud services uh, meet very much uh, the needs the public sector has, and this is what I would like to talk about in the next few minutes. So next slide, please. Um, could you please put all the, all the things uh, in? Uh, okay. Um, so, what is it all about? Um, what does the cloud service de deliver to us? It ensures the optimum use of fixed IT budgets. And we see, of course, shrinking IT budgets also in the public sector. If I take the example of Spain, the IT budget from 2011 to 2012 has been reduced by 20%, for instance. And we will see the same in other countries, of course. Um, cloud optimizes cost effectiveness of data centers. It optimizes resource utiliza utilization. Uh, it enhances energy e efficiency by the use of green IT in the data centers, which is, of course, a very important topic, It's especially for T-Systems, uh, to use green IT. And for corporate customers, it becomes more and more important to make use of green resources. It's because it's al also uh, an, an argument for investors to invest in green companies, which are using green services and green IT is also important for us uh, with regard to cloud services. It optimizes IT complexity versus usability uh, to, to en and, and enables uh, the user to have uh, the latest service in place if you use cloud services. It meets high expectations of the customers. It provides fast and temporary computing power in time on demand, which we see uh, in logistic industries. It comes now also to the IT industry and uh, this is a great advantage to my mind. If you go to the next slide, what are the public sector requirements? And you see this fits very much to the things the cloud service or the cloud can deliver. Uh, it's cost optimization because in a very intelligent made uh, architecture, it will reduce the cost because you reduce uh, uh, the resources, for instance, on the desktops of, of the users and you have it in the cloud, which, which means economy of scale. You are in a modernized uh, environment because you keep pace with the latest developments and don't have to invest every single time again in new resources and new infrastructure. You are much faster and more flexible than before. You uh, um, respect data security rules, which are in Europe the, uh, um, uh, the strictest you have in the world, and we stick to these rules. You have fallback options in the cloud, you have integration of legacy IT, you have data control, of course, you have service level agreements over the services, and of course you have uh, the offer of compliance services. And all these things address to my mind uh, trends which we see in the public sector. Of course, uh, the lack of or redu uh, reduction of budgets, the need for modernization in the administration, the need for e-services, um, open government services, um, uh, e-government services like voting, e-government services uh, or computing power for police. And you see if you discuss with, with police uh, uh, authorities a lack of computing power in following uh, the breach of law, 
um, because uh, 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 the people who do this have power behind and usually it's quite some economic power and if you see the police forces for instance they don't have enough uh, um, computing power to follow the activities of, of these uh, people. So, um, uh, and for instance, uh, and one other, other uh, example is, for instance, uh, telematic solutions. Uh, we have heard today some of uh, the president speakers had problems to come here in, in the Brussels uh, transport and the Brussels traffic jams. Um, if we come to smarter cities, therefore cloud services uh, uh, offer the opportunity to get smarter cities via the cloud, uh, the offers the cloud uh, can give to, to everybody via telematic solutions and solutions in healthcare and administration in smarter cities, uh, which is also supported by uh, the European uh, Commission in the smartest smart city activities uh, we are seeing here. Next slide, please. What do we offer in here? All, all the services from uh, cloud readiness services to collaboration and mes messaging and what is of high importance to my mind is uh, we deliver a service here which is made in Europe based on European standards, especially data security standards um, and data privacy standards, uh, for which we are of course advertising uh, that we need a European standard here, uh, which is of high importance because we have the highest standard in the world and uh, it's of high importance for our customers and also for the public sector. Uh, where we see, of course, private clouds, but we could see, to my mind, uh, less private clouds. Why couldn't use the city of Cologne and the city of Brussels one private cloud together? I don't see that, that this is impossible. But uh, um, at the moment, we see, of course, many private clouds, uh, a private cloud for the city of Cologne, a private cloud for the city of Brussels, a private cloud for every single city. And there is a huge uh, opportunity to reduce cost and to, re to reduce resources uh, in a safe and, um, let's say, administration-dedicated environment. So, and I would like to conclude, all these things are made for the public sector. To a certain extent, the private sector is the first mover. But the things the cloud offers or could offer to the administrative sector, sector fits very much the needs we see here in the, in the, in the public sector. And uh, we would like to bring administration to the next level of development, which means uh, also administration e-based and in the cloud. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much for having me here. I have a very mixed audience now. Some have heard my gospel already many times. Some, some hear it for the first time. So, let me try to do something innovative. Um, I think I concentrate today around the question of, of motivation because that seems to me very important and also from the previous speakers. There is a difference in motivation between public and private uh, doing that. I'm a civil servant and last presentation I started like that, everybody started laughing. They were uh, obviously not from the civil service. So I, th I would say that I'm proud of it and I would base my uh, presentation on the motivation of a typical civil servant. Now the difference in the motivation there is, while probably for private companies it is profit and uh, making as much turnover or keeping employment, for the civil servant, it is law and everything which is derived from the law. And I'm quite uh, conscious that we have a lot of uh, parliamentarians in the room. So it is guidelines, it is measures, it is whatever which forces us. And maybe there is the problem why the motivation for the civil service to go onto the cloud is so difficult. And I'm trying to explain to you here a little bit uh, what we are trying to do. So. Nelly Cruz, our commissioner, Vice President Nelly Cruz, has stated last year in Davos that she wanted us to be cloud active and has given us three major lines to follow the legal framework, the technical and commercial issues, and the market. And that sets the frame of what we are trying to do. Now, if you translate that into, typically, uh, for a German to use Greek columns these days, um, <laughs> now, <laughs> this... This is, of course, it has to be made a bit. 
Um, so our strategy is based on this. We also would look at some, um, some uh, factors or some stimulation measures, but in the middle you see here this public sector, and I, the real question which is to be asked is the public sector really so different in the use of the cloud, or is it just another user, a very big user with 20% market power roughly, and how can we channel or how we can focus that major user viewpoint. Now, we do that in the next slide. Uh, so th there, you see the motivation also, or the motivations for a cloud strategy are very often based on the single market. And I'm, uh, I'm very conscious, as I have worked for a long time in standardization and trying to rationalize civil services or public services, that the motivation coming from the treaty, from the single market, is not necessarily what everybody has in mind when trying to align the civil services these days and using the advantages of cloud computing. So the need for standards is normally based under the need for a single market or building a single market. So the lead market we are looking into is here the public services. And then we have all those principles, which I see more as attributes, and many of the previous speakers have spoken about, which are the legal framework around that. So coming back to the motivation, is the motivation single market, or is the motivation making lower costs, or is the motivation to align civil services in Europe? All of that, we all know, is a mixture of it, but it is very important to keep the motivation uh, distinct. Now... What we propose is so-called European Cloud Partnership, which Nelly Cruz this year um, announced in Davos. And the purpose is to align the specifications. And how do you do that? It is almost philosophical, because what you're trying to do is uh, to have the same model on which you work in the civil service. Otherwise, you will not gain the benefits of the interoperability or you will not gain the other benefits which we have heard which are necessary, but you also need to have some subject and object which can be put in these legislations which I was talking about. So what we are trying to do is to harmonize the public sector requirements for clouds across <laughs> member states and by that make it possible that we have uh, different, in different uh, application areas the advantages of cloud. Now, there are some listed so that you have them. I jump there. But how do we organize that? We say that there should be some cloud partnership organization, a governance level. We need some governance, governance level. The problem is that governance levels in Brussels take normally very long. Mm -hmm. So how would we do that by have some form of pre-commercial public procurement where everybody would be under a contract, but we would from the outstart leave it to the ones who propose how they want to be governed. And then we would have an office in which the different uh, players could come together. And my idea there is mainly that these could be also some competing consortia, because at the moment the overall cloud topic, as we have seen in the previous speakers, is far too big. So there are some subheadings which have to be addressed and some substandards and some sub requirements which we need in the public service. And this office may consult with the industrial or the academic and we hope, of course, also that it will have some spillover effects. And now it becomes very practical. In phase, phase one, such a cloud office should harmonize the requirements for cloud computing in the public sector in phase two, procure proof of concept solutions and procure implementations in order to demonstrate would then be the third phase. Now, to do that in pre-commercial public procurement has the beauty that you can very close work together with the suppliers, which you normally cannot in public procurement for the obvious reasons that everybody has an interest. But here, we could probably sit together first and because cloud, buying cloud, it became clear from the previous speakers, is quite complex to have an agreement on what actually the specifications are. Now, I've, I, uh, 
harmonize the requirements as clear they agree the public sector and this also includes the standardization requirements um, difficult to go further now that is um, still on on phase one I would have one more slide but it doesn't come no <laughs> well okay doesn't matter I read it out to you um, so there would be a timing of course to this activity so we would do the first step this year in 2012 we have some funding reserved under the seventh framework program for that because it is pre-commercial public procurement and we would call for it in July and have an information day on the 12th of April. Thank you. Thank you. In the beginning, I was thinking uh, to mention the timer, but all the speakers were very good without uh, establishing a timer. They all understood that uh, to measure the time and keep the time is a common interest to us. Although there is a Next meeting waiting for us, I would allow one or two questions if there is a huge interest to ask a question. But if there is not such a, then I will, uh, then, then I think that, uh, uh, that we will ask the question after that during the, there is, there is one. Malcolm. I just wanted to, to pick up on the uh, on Rainer Zimmerman's um, a, a plan for a, a, a pre-commercial procurement, which I have a particular interest in, as he knows. But uh, more broadly, I wasn't entirely sure exactly what he was going to be procuring and for whom. I mean, is he procuring solutions that will be, will be generally applicable? Um, is he procuring a, a whole system? Um, uh, and uh, it would be interesting to hear from the other panelists who are directly involved with this. You know what they think will be the added value of what you are doing in relation to what is already happening, as we heard from Estonia, as we heard from T Systems as well. Um, so, so that that would just will be an interesting piece of dialogue, I think, uh, Madam Chairman, while we have the panelists together. Wonderful. So we have got the questions to the panelists. That what do you think about the procurement was mentioned by Mr. Zimmerman? Do you wish to take the floor? Yeah, we have one question. Yes. Well, I think which is, if, if I was looking at the list of the people sitting here in the audience at the moment, then I think which is largely, largely not straightforward for the particular audience is that how much actually the procurement for the government and procurement for the enterprise differs. And uh, take it take it from the take it from the perspective that one of your branches all of the sudden gets directly sold in the totally different technology you might expect, and and they actually agree buying it, and you find out that one of your branches is operating totally differently than than any other branch, and then the next one gets bought in by different vendor, and so, and and, and this is not a problem. This is how it's meant to be. But this is the ecosystem you have to manage. Now, if you take this one as the cloud, then what happens is that if you do the public tender and if you procure something which could be called as cloud procurement, then your question is absolutely relevant. What do you procure exactly and from whom? Because you are, you are basically buying in a narrative, but a narrative attached with a very loyal, different, uh, very loyal developer base trying to capitalize this buy straight away. A narrative which is attached with a lot of different standards, a lot of different platforms, and a lot of different other narratives. And you can't lock one out either. You can't come up with a solution that, okay, matching uh, diversity is too difficult. Let's, let's lock in with one vendor for next 10 years and let's see what it takes us and let's re, re, re-decide after 10 years if this vendor doesn't prove to be a right one. So this is actually the situation, what is your procurement? At? And, and, uh, and I think it takes everybody's effort on both sides, on the, on the government side, on the EU side, on the, on the company side, to create a solution which would 
allow managing this lock-in somehow. What would make everybody in a competitive situation where competitiveness doesn't mean that, uh, that you should actually rule out somebody, but that the competi competition means that you would be able to have several small ecosystems coexist at certain layer and have this hybrid system working that the jumping from one system to another would be possible. And I, I, I absolutely agree that this has to be solved somehow. Yeah, the, you will get the last, yeah, the first question. Um, as I tried to emphasize, uh, cloud services offer huge opportunities for, for the public sector. Um, we have to make the first step. We have to think about the questions uh, Mr. Zimmermann has mentioned. We have to work it out. We means administration, the procurement side has to do, and uh, industry also has to play its part in it. We have to, we have to cooperate there also, also in uh, bringing, setting into place the right rules for this or the right procurement rules. Uh, but we shouldn't wait too long because we have to make the first steps. Otherwise, others have been faster than we have been and we lag behind. And uh, let's say cloud is also a question of infrastructure. And uh, infrastructure is very important for prosperity uh, in Europe. And we have to be fast, in to fast there because we are in a worldwide competition. Uh, that's why I'm advertising for, let's say, a close cooperation between industry and also the procurement side. And to my mind, uh, the uh, European institutions could be an example for it, knowing, of course, that administration is not so easy, but uh, European institutions should make a first step. And uh, as, I as far as I understand, uh, Commissioner Cruz, uh, she's wanting to go this way, and we are also willing to do so. <laughs> so uh, before Mr. Zimmerman, Linda, would you react? Yes, I would like to, to add also some comments. One thing is, um, we have started in Germany a very small program on trusted cloud. So I think what you are proposing is a huge trusted cloud program, because whatever you never get trust when you don't know how it works. And, and, and finally, it should not be one cloud provider. That's not the solution. The world is heterogeneous. So you have more cloud providers. And the best thing to show that you can do interoperability between different cloud providers is by using scenarios, applications from the government side, and then give the government also the feeling, okay, I now, I can trust, I can bring things into the cloud. So that's what I personally believe is the best thing to do. Thank, thank you. Um, on the question, of what we are actually really procuring. Now, the problem is that normally, and I've been myself a public procurer for, for six or seven years, and it is extremely difficult to buy these kind of IT services and stay within the law and stay inside the, the procedures. And especially in the commission as we have written the directive and we had to be even more strict in implementing the directive. Now, if, if you have that experience, you learn one thing, that civil servants try to find a way to download that enormous amount of work, or you can say they are lazy, but what they do is they create a database of formulations which they use in public services, it's called specifications. And these specifications are incredibly difficult to work on. You need an enormous technical know-how to do that, which you normally do not have in public services. That's not always very simple. And it includes software. It includes testing. It includes any certification software needed. And for that, you need first to sit together and fix that with the ones who technically know what is possible and what not. So what we are buying, I think, is pretty clear. We want to have requirements, agreed requirements, which we even then, after a pre-commercial public procurement, would own and could give for free to the different public administrations. We want to have proof of concept, of course, otherwise nobody will buy and, and believe in our requirements, and we want to have probably some 
pilot implementation in which we showed that it works. And when you are through that process once centrally, then it becomes easy for all those civil servants who have to copy afterwards, uh, copy and paste the specifications in their tendering. And it aligns as a side effect the, the markets and gives a, a certain competition between providers. Thank you. To you, does it mean that you then will end up with standard services for uh, public administrations? Some of them will be standard services, but not, of course, not the 100%. But some of it uh, needs to be what we call platform services or service as a platform. You want on that platform different companies to compete, and you want to have alternatives in switching between different uh, providers. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, before, uh, be, because we are really out of time, uh, I don't think that I would allow other questions to take. We have heard about the need for first uh, moving action, and we have heard the answer that the Commission is moving. We have got a very different opinion that we, we, we would need a sky full with small clouds, or we would need a blue sky with one big cloud. We have seen from the businesses the rainbow, which is probably most liked by the citizens. Uh, and we have to avoid the wonder storm because this is definitely not what we want to achieve. Uh, and with this, I think uh, we have to finish here. And uh, I think the EIF Foundation has learned that it was a really great uh, subject and probably will continue. Definitely we will continue tomorrow by the greening, uh, greening meaning of the cloud computing if you come for the breakfast. And now it's the time to meet the uh, commissioner for the round table and then for the buffet lines. Thanks to being here. Thank you.